Right, perfect. Okay, so welcome everybody to uh, Strategic Cereal Farm Scotland. Uh, David and I are here at Bulburnie in the lovely Muddy Boots Cafe, hence the, the background that you see. Um, so we're going to take you through the trials um, and how we're getting on with things in season um, at Bulburnie this year. And I promise I'm under strict instru instructions not to draw conclusions from where we are so far, otherwise we'll get a real row. There might be a couple tenuous links, but we'll, we'll, we'll try to, to save it until the results meeting uh, in the back end once we've got some conclusive data. Um, so as usual housekeeping today, uh, everyone's on mute throughout the webinar. Uh, any questions, you've got the box down the side there that you can type them in. I'll try to answer them as they go. If we need to run a poll, we'll put some pressure on Christian to get that done for us. That's no problem. Um, Try to stay on time that's not my strength but we'll give it a bash uh, just depends how much questions we go we get as we go through it has been recorded so it'll be played um at a later date on our youtube channel and no doubt sheila will tweet it um from the hdb scotland twitter feed as well um so we're joined today by paul hargreaves uh, who was a lecturer of mine at, at sac as well back in the day uh, and it's great to have paul with us we've got donald patterson from scottish agronomy uh, who's the agronomist um, at Bulburnie, who um, absorbs all of this um, that David's doing in a fantastic a fantastic way. And then we've got David uh, with us as well. Um, basis and Enroso points. So if you want to pop your um, basis uh, number and your Enroso number in the question box, we'll pick that up and uh, apply for points. I think it's one or two, one point available from basis and it'll be one point from Enroso. So every little helps, um, but it's worthwhile. Um, okay, so if we go through the format for today, we'll just go through and give a season overview of the trials and then our one and only trial this year because we are in the baseline in year one. Uh, we've got our managed lower inputs trial, which has been a lot of realizations this year as to how to go about it, what to do. And we've got SRUC on board with us testing the crop as we go, which ultimately is the first step of IPM. Um, and then in the quick hour, we've got some time for questions and discussions, and then we'll inform you about next week's webinar, which is the big, um, big one for us, uh, where we've got quite a quite a day planned uh, with two sessions, morning and uh, lunchtime for that one. Um, so if we go on to it, we'll, we'll hand over uh, to, to Donald and David just to give us a, an in-season update from Scotland, which has been uh, very interesting this year, uh, in, especially weather-wise. Uh, yeah, so I can give you a quick update. So yeah, as Chris had said, it's been a pretty variable weather-wise in the past few months. So yeah, April, as we kind of all know, was pretty cold and dry and disease levels were pretty low back then. And then May had just seemed to be rain for most of the month for most people and everything was sitting pretty wet. But in the last week or 10 days, with a bit warmer temperatures, we have been seeing uh, certainly disease levels are starting to rise now and crops are growing pretty quick. So we have started to see yellow rust come in on some varieties of wheat um, and then we are starting to see a wee bit of mildew coming into some crops wheat and oats and a wee bit of septoria starting to build in the wheat as well so yeah it's starting to change in the last uh, week or 10 days or so and yeah see what the weather does in this next month and what differences we notice and do you think donald when you've seen the septoria that's way down there in, in leaf uh, four or five do you think we're, it's going to come up the plant that quick i mean you've seen pictures from the south now that it is really racing isn't it i mean what are you seeing in the trials which are just next door um to us here yeah so as you say it's all still in the base of the crop at the moment um but given the amount of rain that we had during may i think the disease is just slow to that we can't really see it yet just because of the cold temperatures it's been slow to um replicate but i would think in the next few weeks now given the rain that we had it will start to show more and start to move up the crop and then it'll depend the levels will just depend on what weather we get june july if it stays dry then it's not going to spread right up the crop but if we get kind of showery weather or heavy showers and that then yeah that will make it spread up the crop more so yeah, yeah but there's definitely more there now than there was a few weeks ago and definitely a tricky choice, um, you know, with people after the weather just ready to put T2s on, you know, it's going to be a quick fire a uh, couple of weeks before we're straight back through with T3s, isn't it? It's it's hard to know what to do. Yeah, that is the trouble. Now that we've got warmth and obviously the, the crops have had all that water, so they're just growing that quick now. So, yeah, we're going to, there's a lot of T2 on the wheats going on this week. But, yeah, like you say, we could be back around with the T3s in two weeks' time. Um, but, yeah, 
given how slow it was at the start of the season, everything's just catching up now. Yeah, fantastic. And and how have you been getting on walking around Bullburnie? Uh, usual, it's been a hard one to try and get on top of weeds as well, hasn't it? And the yeah, d- differences in in fungicide ap- approach as well. Yeah, well, certainly herbicides. The start of the year was tricky because it was so dry; stuff wasn't coming through. And then obviously it's the same kind of thing with the fung with the herbicides that we've been talking about with the fungicides. Suddenly the weeds just came rushing through after the rain. So yeah, there's been quite a lot of weeds through spring crop as well. Um, but yeah, it's just trying to, yeah, I think everyone's, well, there's good spray conditions now, so everyone's kind of getting caught up again, so that's making life a bit easier again. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, guys, for those of you who have just arrived, if you base us on Enrosa numbers, that way, point it uh, down into the chat. If you put it in the questions tab, if you click it, uh, just pop your basis and Enrosa number in there, if you can remember it, and uh, we'll pick that up and apply for it. So we'll go to David um, just for a, for an update of of how the season's gone at Bullburnie, apart apart from quickly. But uh, yeah, we'll hand to David now. Morning, everybody. Um, yeah, as Donald said, it's been a it's been a challenging season this year. Um, obviously, dry and cold at the start, which is wonderful for keeping disease at bay, but horrendous for getting crop growth. You know, um, crops just sat still for so long. Um, We've been, uh, certainly on our winter crops, we've been trying to get away with using a biological and nutrition approach for disease control. And early on, we thought we were doing a wonderful job because there just wasn't any disease, but it turned out there just wasn't any disease. Um, Now after the rain, uh, as everybody who tries this kind of system discovers, it appears to be yellow rust is the the struggle. So we're seeing the real differences. Uh, Donald and I were through crops just on um, Tuesday afternoon, seeing a real difference in the yellow rust with sowing dates. Obviously, the earlier sowing stuff a little bit dirtier. So we have had to bail out on the wheat this year and put a fungicide on just to try and check the yellow rust because we don't seem to have any answer to that yet. Um, but we've been busy with sap t- taking tissue samples for sap analysis as well, which has proved a big challenge. More so, getting them delivered. To the lab than actually taking the sample um, and it's thrown up probably more questions than answers uh, so far it just kind of highlights how much the crop relies on temperature soil temperature air temperature biology to uptake nutrients and things can be up one week and down the next and it's difficult to gauge whether we should be rushing out with a, a can every time we see something low or do we sit and wait for a week, 10 days, and see if nature corrects itself. Um, we have an awful lot to learn on that front. Um, but by and large, septoria, it's in the bottom of the crop, later sowing stuff, anything that's had sheep over it through the winter is cleaner, uh, notably, at the minute. So that's looking like a promising um, option for us in the future. Just work that into the system. And uh, yeah quite happy with the growth we've got now that's for sure tiller numbers have held on in the winter crops quite amazingly actually usually we lose them pretty rapidly at Balburnie um, and I was quite worried with some of the things coming through the winter but the, the tillers seem to have held on this year whether the rain just came in time um, so yeah with the moisture in the ground now and the sunshine there's a bit of promise if we can keep the disease at bay perfect thanks thanks very much David um, so I, again, if, if we go back to our slides just now, so year one, um, we are doing the baseline assessments uh, across the farm to get you know a handle on where we are to get the representative data. Then the trials will be carried out on these fields over the next five years of the project, uh, and we will have a repeat baselining in year three and year six just to monitor the change. Which this has been great, uh, you know, been around Bullburnie for a few years now, and um, you know, watching what David's done and the transition to it, and it's just a nice way to try and help on the journey to try and quantify it. And we've already had quite a few realizations um, this year with the trials that we set out that, you know, are we measuring the right things? Are we looking at everything in the right format? And we've, we've tried to get the testing there in one of our trials to try and lead the information forward as to what we apply, which, as David said, has, has proved difficult this year with, with, with COVID and whatnot. Um, so our soil health on the next one, Christian. Um, We've got Paul that will take us through this. So we had a, 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 an interesting uh, time of it this year where with the wet weather, we decided to re-sample in the spring 
um, as we had started it in the back end. And we just thought when it got so wet, we stopped and then we went back through it. So um, we do have the results there, which will come out again uh, in the results meeting in the back end, which hopefully will be in person, not online, but we'll, we'll need to wait and see for that one. Um, so, Paul, uh, over to yourself. We've gone through the standard here. We've got modified Morgans in there. We've got the penetrometer resistance looking for compaction, obviously the biggest enemy in arable farming, isn't it? Um, I, I, and again, looking at the elemental composition of the soil to see where it is. Um, what's your thoughts so far? Uh, on the results I've seen, I mean, this is a kind of new system thinking about soil health in the round and it's the biology, physics and chemistry that we're, like, we're looking at here. Uh, probably people are more familiar with just the chemical results from the soil analysis you sent off that tells you more or less about the uh, P, K, uh, uh, M, G, P, H kind of uh, assessments of your soils. Well, what we're trying to do here is also bring in the biological and the physical aspects because these have um, bearings on how the nutrients that you're applying to your soils are being taken up by the crop. Penetrometer resistance has been done, and as uh, Chris says, this is uh, an indication of your soil compaction, but also uh, there's a VES has been done, which is something that was developed through SIUC. It's uh, using uh, nothing more sophisticated than a spade, so it's a relatively uh, simple method to use. You're digging out a block of soil, and pulling it apart to see if there's been any uh, effects of uh, compaction on that soil and any um, detrimental effects on the soil structure. And it's that's important because this is where the microbial populations are. This is where the activity within the soil takes place. And this is the uh, it's the soil biology that really allows the nutrients that you're adding to become available to the uh, uh, to the crops that are growing. So having good soil structure is very important. And I'm sure people have seen where they've had wheelings or there's been a lot of traffic on the field where you're seeing reduced uh, growth or reduced yield in those areas. And it potentially, it ultimately is uh, uh, related to a lack of nutrient uptake, but it's to do with the uh, structure of the soil there and the damage to that structure that's reducing that uh, nutrient uptake. Again, earthworm counts is a soil biology uh, component that we're looking at. Uh, this is an indication of the activity within the soil. More earthworms, the better activity, uh, the better chance the nutrients that you're adding to the soil is being taken up there and a better soil health in general. And all this kind of relates through to moisture holding capacity, infiltration rates. Um, so it's uh, looking at soil health in the round to give a better picture of uh, what your soil's doing and how it's providing and uh, making the nutrients that you're adding uh, available to the crops that are growing there. And Paul, I mean, how big a reliance or, or, or how big an emphasis rather is a better word, um, do you put on the soil infiltration rate? Like, is that telling you quite a lot about the soil and what's going on or is that something we should be looking at? Uh, it, it is, but uh, it, again, it's related to the soil structure. So something like a, a, a poor VES score is probably going to also indicate the infiltration rates are poor as well. We've seen uh, some kind of converse argument of uh, situations with uh, VES scores uh, where a small amount of compaction can be useful uh, in um, the longer term, if it's dry over the summer, then there's potentially the water isn't moving through the soil profile as quickly and is held within uh, the soil. So it can give a slight advantage there. But I'm always very nervous of saying that to farmers and consultants because what I don't want to be saying is go out and compact your soils because there's greater problems with compacted soils as I'm sure people know when they go in and try to uh, do something about those and try and mitigate problems with uh, soil compaction that uh, you'd rather it not being there in the first place over this slight advantage of uh, holding on to some soil when it's dry. 
Perfect. And on to the next slide, we've got our health scorecard here. Um, I know Celine's got a question in there, um, but this is our results so far um, from it, which again, we're not drawing conclusions or showing results that will come later on, but this is just from an initial look through uh, we've got there. So we've got our VEST scores um, uh, from, well, just an example of it really, um, which does, you know, I mean, everything seems to be in order, doesn't it really, Paul? It is, and I mean, this is something that we've also been trying to develop to try and make um, or draw attention to uh, areas that are good and that uh, maybe need some attention within fields uh, using this kind of traffic light system. Uh, so there's bands behind that that have been developed that uh, uh, show good or bad um, uh, situations within the soil. And as you say, a lot of greens are positive uh, in this situation. And you can see relatively quickly across a field or comparing fields where the problems might be. And again, without going into the, uh, without going into the results too much, um, some of this is really, you know, thankfully telling us what we'd expect really. Adding organic material to your soils is beneficial and not just for the soil organic matter that sometimes can take a while to see a change in that. When I say a while, I'm saying, you know, five to 10 years. Uh, but it's uh, you shouldn't be put off by not seeing anything dramatic there because it can take a while to build up. But obviously, it's having some kind of a positive effect on pH and other extractable nutrients within the soil. And this is important when you have soil samples done that you're looking at this kind of extractable component of it because that's what's available to the uh, to the growing crop. And that's what you want to know what levels are available to the growing crop. Sometimes if you go for, say, a total P, your soil might look like it's high in P, but it's the extractable P that's important, the stuff that's available uh, to the plant. Sometimes uh, levels of P can be locked up within soil or in uh, soil aggregates and not really that readily available. So it's important to get the, the, the correct assessment done when you're sending your soil samples off as well. Again, the VEST scores are looking very good here. A one or two would be no uh, immediate problems. Uh, again, we try and temper this by saying that if you do then run across your field, this is not meaning that you're, because you've got one or two as your VEST score within your field, that your field is then immune to any further compaction. If you do go on in wet weather conditions, the closer it gets to field capacity, the wetter the soils are, the more likely then you can still cause damage to your soils. Uh, and so if that does happen, then it might be worth going and doing a, a, a VES assessment after that, just to see if there has been any change to the soil structure. But again, we we'll see here adding manures, adding organic material to uh, the system should help in uh, maintaining a better or more robust soil structure. And again, the yeah. earthworm numbers are kind of drawing this out as well, which is uh, is good to see as well. Yeah, absolutely. And um, you know, one of the things uh, w we were going to to uh, to ask there was that the bands do correlate to soil type. Um, as well, so you know, soil type is a measure that's in there. Um, and I suppose a question um, to David, if I can find it, uh, is David seeing the soil health card results correlating with how he thinks the field performs? Will there be any tie-up with those results and yield or crop input data? I think there's, you know, and David, feel free to chip in with that. And there's a lot in there, isn't there? Because as Paul's highlighting, you've got the available nutrition, which is soil available, but then there's a different interpretation of that into plant available, which David, I'll let you elaborate on that. Um, yeah, there's uh, several well, schools of thought on this. I, I get confused. It's, we look at extractable phosphate, for example, in the soils, and yet, yeah, as Paul pointed out, a lot of it's locked up and not available to the plant. So it's how do we get more of that phosphate available? For years and years, we've been chucking on phosphate fertilisers, and all we've been doing is effectively adding to the bank and not actually helping the crop per se. So we've actually stopped the last couple of years putting P on in that form just because we want to try and get the biology active and 
extracting more itself. Um, that what has been notable, and we kind of knew it really beforehand, was that the water infiltration rates um, on the farm are nowhere near what we would like, um, and I think that has a real, a bigger impact on soil health than than we might like to admit. You know, we see runoff, we see ponding and puddling and things in fields, um, and it's been very notable both at Valverde and on farms local to us. Uh, through um, the very wet May, that spring crops generally came out, the ground really looking quite nice and even, and pat ourselves on the back and thought, gosh, we've got a good job this spring, and then we've had three or four inches of rain in, in May, and um, well, we've got some nice rainbow-coloured fields now, unfortunately. Uh, and this it doesn't appear to be specific to any particular cultivation type. Um, yeah, that picture that's there, that field is a, is a very interesting colour now, um, all sorts of shades of green and yellow in it. Um, but the the the, compact, the penetrometer results would tell you, you know, there's a pan two or three inches down and, and that's just what's done it. Um, in fact, even we noticed on longer term direct drill fields this year, actually, this, this, there seems to have been, whether it's the huge amount of rain we've had over this winter, whether the top of the soil is just sealed a little bit. Um, but even what we thought were good soils have performed relatively poorly through this wet spell in May. Um, yeah, so it's interesting stuff. Water infiltration and water holding are the things that I'm most interested in in the short term. Those are the things we've got to improve on. Uh, and David, very interestingly, you know, probably uniquely at Bulbarney, you know, you've, there's a, a strong history around these parts of paper mills. Um, you know, you're lucky enough to get the the, the paper um, that that's left over, which is obviously high in calcium, which brings us on to you know the the big five, um, which is your N, your K, um, your Mag, calcium, um, and, and magnesium, and you know these are all very important ratios. And you've been applying quite a bit of calcium. I know this is something you're into as well, Paul. And it's just how important is that in terms of disease and silicon and trying to prevent disease. Um, because you've not been heavy on lime at all, have you? No, not since we've had access to the paper crumble. We've been able to push the pHs quite uh, quite well, actually, and you can see the results there. We haven't quite managed to get the variability of it sorted out yet, but th that'll come. Um, it has been useful, and I'm, I'm pretty positive it's improved uh, output on the fields. Of course, it's cheap compared to buying lime, so I'm all for it. <laughs> And Paul, that will be one of your favourites, the calcifert uh, on grass especially, but on arable crops, you know, we do st start to see, a, a, you know, put a big um, emphasis on that, don't we? Yeah, and I think, again, uh, I don't know if we're going over old ground here, but uh, some of the results we've seen from uh, analysis of results we're getting back from the labs at SA. C and SRUC is that pH is still a problem in a lot of fields, not just uh, grassland fields, which are sadly uh, are worse than uh, some of the um, uh, arable fields on average, that the pH isn't being maintained at the levels that uh, we would expect. Uh, and this is still very important because it does strongly affect the take up of other nutrients and how things are released and the chemistry within the soil. So it's important to uh, uh, maintain your pHs at levels that uh, are recommended so you can have all the nutrients that you're adding uh, being as effective as possible. Uh, and yeah, Kelsey, for useful uh, uh, to keep your, your calcium levels up. Calcium is important to growing crop for kind of structure as well as some other uh, aspects of the crop there. So it's uh, important that the levels of uh, calcium are kept up as well as maintaining your pH. But again, pH is important because if it drops below certain levels, especially 5.55, then you start leaving yourself open for potential reduced resilience to the crop, for uh, even for the nutrients you're putting on, but also it, it changes to uh, um, the chemistry within the soil, and you can start uh, um, uh, losing uh, nutrients or potentially starting to uptake uh, 
uh, other uh, chemicals within the soil that you might not want to as say aluminium becomes the buffer instead of calcium so it's important those those levels are maintained absolutely you know a, cu a couple of things there um definitely in terms of the, the, the calcium being a big one and the ph you know the idea that ph 6.4 is for the soil it's the same for the plant is what we're realizing and you know if your ph in the soil isn't at 6.4 well you're going to have to work pretty hard to get the plant to 6.4 Therefore, you know, you've got your disease levels come in, which is, I think is where maybe the calcium, if I remember rightly, a few years ago since I was lectured, Paul, but, uh, <laughs> you know, I, th I think that's where we were getting to. And the, the pH, the potential hydrogen, now really going back to college here, but potential hydrogen is a gaseous release from the soil, depending on the minerals that are involved, isn't it? It is, and it's also the, the, the kind of buffer potential of that as well. So it's the kind of, it is the, the kind of chemistry and it's the enzymes of not just the, um, the, the, the crop that's growing, it's also of the soil biology as well. And this is why in some ways um, earthworms may seem a little flippant going out and collecting or counting the number of earthworms there, but they are a good indication of what the crop is experiencing as well. So you've got more earthworms and you've got better conditions for the crop to grow in. Uh, and uh, earthworms tend to like the similar conditions to, um, to the crops that are growing as well. So again, uh, it's coming back to this idea of soil quality and thinking of the soil biology as well as the chemistry and uh, the physics and what is this all telling us really. Absolutely and I wonder you know if we go back to our calcium is there really two things if we're looking for the, the hydrogen release as the pH to get the soil right to keep the soil life going but actually your calcium's more probably general about the plant pH to keep that up to get your, your, your plant health up versus the soil so you've got soil sampling variable lime which is great, but then the bits that aren't getting lime are probably missing calcium. How do we how do we bring that into the, the equation? I think that's true. And again, I think this is looking carefully at what your soil samples and your soil analysis is telling you. You may have a adequate pH, but is your calcium level uh, in the kind of range that we're looking for as well? And a good soil analysis should really be you know, giving you hopefully the kind of bands that you're working in there as it does for, you know, P, uh, uh, K, um, MG, the, you, you'll be told <laughs> what kind of level it is. And if it's a plus or my, uh, M, moderate plus or minus, you're doing okay. If it's low or high, then you need to be thinking about uh, other aspects of it. And again, you know, you might have too much, sometimes too much of a nutrient is, uh, not beneficial as well, not just for the, the cost that you've incurred adding that to the soil, but again to the soil chemistry. So having a pH, if you think, oh, I'll keep adding uh, lime, get my pH over seven, uh, get it into seven and a half, eight. Again, that's not just causing uh, financial uh, problems if you're adding uh, lime uh, when you don't need to but also it can affect the uptake of nutrients as well and start to lock up some of those. And we've seen with some of the longer trials up in Aberdeen, where there's uh, different pHs, that up to about seven, seven and a half is fine. After that, you start seeing reductions in yield as well. So you're getting a, a double uh, disadvantage there. You're getting uh, stress to the crop, but also you're adding uh, lime and incurring costs for that with no advantage. And it's one of these things, you know, again, we go back to the pH 6.4 of, of the plant, which we'll come on to later if we don't run out of time, which we're looking like. But um, <laughs> pH 6.4 for the plant, the soil for humans, we're all the same. You know, this is a bit, if you've got a pH of 7, you've gone too high. So that takes you into a different scenario for it, um, which, which is is a different set um, of results you get back from from your plant analysis, isn't it? That's, that's, that's the tricky yeah. bit. Yeah. Yeah. And again, um, you know, a lot of this starts from the soil. If you can get the soil right, then hopefully your crop and crop resilience will uh, will improve and you can, uh, you know, take, reap the advantages of that. Absolutely. And pH 6.4 once in five years is maybe needing a bit more frequency in the sampling to make sure it's just bang on. Um, 
I and think so. And again, the other thing that's been looked at here is looking at uh, pH sampling in a grid system across fields. So again, what it's bringing out there is you're getting variability, as David uh, said uh, earlier on, you're getting variability across your field. In the past, you would have taken a mean value there. And if it had come out at, say, six, and you were adding more just to bring it up to 6.4 parts of that field may already be at 6.4 so again you're wasting the the, the 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 lime there and the added potential you're getting from that so this kind of uh, if you can very variable variable applications of your lime then hopefully you're saving there but also you're bringing the areas of the field that may be at you know 5.9 up to the level that you 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 wanting yeah and i think christian you've got a poll hopefully uh on just to see you you know it's this difference between ph and calcium which paul and i debate uh, quite a lot and we're just wondering you know just to think about this calcium application um as more as a crop application rather than um a soil application there is lime applied but then there's calcium which the crops have a requirement for which Paul has done a, a you know a lifetime's work on, um, which again will come out in our winter conference um, with with SAC in the back end. We'll be doing more on that. So um, we've got the poll here. So how many people routinely apply calcium to crops or soil? So we're just looking for a, a, a quick answer here um, for those that are on the call. So thanks, Christian. Do you want to? Shall we close that now? So there we go. I can't see the numbers there, but uh, we've got oh, yeah. seventy percent no and twenty-five percent yes. Ah, uh -huh. so there's an interesting uh, scope there in terms of um, you know, do we monitor calcium? Do we apply calcium? Um, Paul, what's your thoughts on that? Uh... <laughs> As we've uh, discussed in the past, I think uh, if you're keeping your pH up and you're putting a calcium fertilizer on, then you should have adequate amounts of calcium uh, and it should be available to the plants, uh, uh, crops. But however, in wet years, uh, especially the start of years, then it might be worth just checking to make sure there's uh, sufficient uh, calcium for uh, for that growing crop. Or if you're having a a, a, um, a field that uh, generally needs a bit more uh, calcium uh, uh, lime in, they have a sandier field that doesn't hold on to the lime uh, and the pH uh, aspects of that lime as well then it might be worth just uh, checking on that field to see if calcium is a problem. Yeah, absolutely. Now, and getting a good nudge um, from, from Miss Geary to, to, to hurry up as usual. Um, so pest and natural enemies, um, natural enemies, I mean, slugs, my word, slugs. Um, so we have been at Bill Burney just looking at pest and natural enemies, which is is more of, of David and Donald's uh, speciality. They're more on the ground here than I am. So we're, we're going to get some input uh, from David as, as to what's been going on here, just to check on it. Because it's one of these things that we do see an increased pressure um, from slugs, especially when, when we do change a system and it does tend to favour them. Um, so it, David, do you want to take us through that? Yeah, OK, Chris. Um... Yeah, this spring, um, the guys have been out from SRUC um, putting down traps. You can see pictures below, pitfall traps that were put in, um, and slug traps were put in as well to get an assessment um, of what we have on the ground currently. Um, and the results have been quite interesting. An awful lot of beetles are found, which is a good. good. Um, there's also been... Uh, nest sites put out nest boxes put out for solitary bees um they they, they haven't proved very fruitful this year purely because i think it's been such a cold miserable spring and uh, there's a picture of one there um the uh those bees are kind of active end of march into april and of course there was nothing around for them this year for them so i'm not sure if any of them have been actually um used at all which is a shame but Maybe it'll be an indicator in three years' time, and we can see if the situation is proved, or is it purely going to tell us that well, nature knows best, and it's just been a terribly cold spring that hasn't been very good for some parts of the wildlife. And next time we baseline, it might be a wonderful warm early spring, and we might falsely pat ourselves on the back. 
when actually it's been nature that's done the work for us. Um, so yeah, that you can see an outline of some of the fields of where some of the sites are um, at the east end of the farm. And we will await and see what the results are. And I'm hopeful that we can make improvements um, through the use of cover crops and how we treat the crops perhaps in the fields to, to the wildlife. And obviously, Bulburnie is a very diverse uh, estate and has a lot going on with forestry. So there is, you know, it's not a broad acre arable farm. Um, you know, there's a huge emphasis on wildlife um, throughout the estate. So it's great to try and, you know, monitor how this is, is helping with it. And obviously, there's quite a livestock um, element to the farm as well, which goes around, which, which does impact this um, as well. And obviously, we're monitoring the cereals that go around this rotation. Um, but, but David, you're out wintering, or, or basically the cattle are out all the time, aren't they? Pretty much, yes. Um, the picture there, that, that's the aftermath of cows having been on uh, a kale field for the winter. Um, it was a pretty grim winter. That was actually a lake most of the winter at the bottom of the hill, just obviously water infiltration, not very good. But the burn's only about 10 yards from there. Um, that feels now in spring barley and looks tremendous. So, you know, just keeping the cattle and building the fertility on the, on the soils as we go. Like a lot of farms, we've, we've segregated our animals and our arable over the years, um, and we're trying to reintegrate them back together to, to reduce costs on both sides of the business, both for the livestock by way of cover crops and not having to house them so much, and for the arable side, reduction in the fertility whilst also reducing the cost of getting that, that fertility onto the ground. Absolutely. And a question in from Maria there. Um, will the pest and natural enemies be baselined at different times of the season or just once? Um, I, it's been ongoing since March and it will be all the way through the season uh, to build up the correlations that we have. And it will be repeated again in year three um, and year, year six just to see how we have progressed with it. And, you know, David has a, a five or a six course rotation and there is potatoes and veg in there as well. Um, so we will just see how that impacts it. But there's been quite a few steps you've taken uh, with your potato grower. Uh, Mr. Wilson's very on side with some of the strategies you've put in. David, isn't that right? Uh, yeah, particularly um, we, were, we, we observe that there's a lot of damage as we all know to the soil with these intensive root crops. Um, and we, the, most of the damage seems to occur on the end rigs and the tram lines. So we approached our potato growers this year with a view to mitigating that. So what they've done is end rigs basically are not getting planted and they get put in a summer cover crop. Um, and the tram lines haven't been planted either. So they've got nice wide dry tram lines to travel on, which I think has been a real benefit this spring with the, the weather they've had in in um in may they haven't made a mess at all which is great um and it appears there's work out there that suggests actually financially there's no detriment to the potato grower either um in terms of quality of the crop and harvesting efficiency improvements and planting as well so we'll see how we see how we progress with that but it looks positive at the minute Good. So uh, the crop health baselining uh, that's going on, we've got spring barley, oats and winter wheat crops being assessed throughout the season, <clears throat> monitoring the crop growth disease um, and also the yield. So, uh, you, you know, this is all going on in the same fields as we go around the rotation. So every time there's a new crop goes in, we can see the effect of that crop um, on it. We are looking at satellite imagery. We've got biomass there. We've got bricks meter readings. We've got soil samples. We've got disease scores. Um, we've got loads of stuff going on with this, which will come out in the results meeting uh, as well. And we've got our tissue analysis, tissue analysis and sap analysis, which has been fantastically uh, insightful this year, um, to say the least. Um, so as we go through it, our, our one trial field um, is our Tank Wilson's March field, um, which we will be looking at a few different trials in there uh, this season, um, which we'll come on to in a bit. Um, so again, the, the disease levels, Donald, particularly low this year, not seeing much of a response to anything. How, how do you think that's uh, impacted the crop? You, you know, as we move on now, I think David, you admitted the T zero spray, didn't didn't you, on decision? Yeah, no, I think um, 
around and about, yeah. In terms of early on, like we were saying at the start, disease levels were very low back at the start of spring. And yeah, with it being so cold, I think quite a few people omitted the T0 spray, depending on what varieties they were growing. And just at that time of year, the disease pressure was quite low. Um, as we've moved on through May, obviously it was quite wet, like we said, T1s are now all on, and most people are now at T2s on the wheat. And like we were saying, just with the warmer weather, we're starting to see disease develop a bit more now. So yeah, it'll just be to see how that develops in the next few weeks, but it's certainly picking up. And yeah, as we've seen, as we said, yellow rust, mildew, septoria are all becoming more obvious than they were even 10 days ago. Absolutely. And then when we come on to, uh, David's got some winter sown spring oats or spring variety sown in the winter time, which, you know, lucky you on the south coast of Fife for getting away with that. But, the, you know, mildew, um, absolutely prevalent here when it gets going, isn't it? How, how's, uh, how's the mildew levels done, you know, when you're trying to look to culturally control it, has it worked? Um, it's been difficult in these picture fields in these pictures because they were so in mm, third week in September uh, after cauliflower so it's a hugely hugely high residual fertility from the, the, the brassica crop and mildew just dogged that crop right from the start um, it's it looks all right now it's in the base of the crop and the crop seems to have grown away from it but we've other fields that were sown three weeks later same crop similar scenario and the disease is nigh on non-existent i think we just it's and as i said at the very start with the wheats as well we could really pull out the difference in sowing dates with the disease levels it's really obvious um this year the later ones are just pretty clean and earlier ones are just getting dirtier but that's to be expected i would imagine yeah yeah i would just say the sowing date has been important and then like you mentioned as well grazing as well if, if you if people are wanting to sow early in early September and that kind of thing, there's the option of grazing it back to try and make the crop think that it's been later drilled and so you're kind of actually buying yourself a bit of time and that has, from what I've seen, it has helped to reduce uh, disease levels, especially in varieties that have got good inherent resistance in them. So yeah, that can help as well as another option. Ideal. And we just uh, catch a glimpse of that as we move through on the bottom there, David, you, you, you know, you do always try things out with the trial on, on the farm as well. You've got a couple of different varieties in and different spacings on the drill there as well being tried. Uh, yeah, we wanted to, the, the, the spacings there are a little awry compared to what the plan was, but um, miscommunication between myself and, and uh, seed drill. But the idea is to uh looking at wider row spacing um particularly with the reduction the potential reduction in herbicides and things like that can we how is it going to impact on spring barley we hear a lot that say winter crops can cope the yields aren't really suffering at all from wider row spacing but the, the issue seemed to be with spring barley and as we grew quite an area of spring barley we were concerned so we thought well we'll, we'll drill a hectare with wider row spacing and, and monitor it from through to harvest, you know, is, is it brackling that gets it in the end? Um, are there too much, too many weeds? But maybe we can deal with them with a hoe in the future. Um, I will notice, I, I can see this field out the front of my house and the last week that particular tram line has just gone a really, really dark, very, very dark green compared to the rest of the field. The seed rate wasn't changed, we just basically blocked off half the spouts, um, but it's gone noticeably much much darker shade of green which would indicate it's not suffering at this stage um, so we'll monitor that through to harvest and it's an interesting thing i suppose that you know when you do look at other drill types and and wider drills um which you know bill Burnley are, are, are looking into you know the row spacing does go out the way you know for the folding mechanisms and you know it's just is there an impact on that i know the yen results would probably suggest there is and there's an optimum and i think in scotland we find with spring barley uh, especially, uh, I, I mean, it, it's worse than sheep for, for showing um, symptoms and diseases and wanting to lay down and die. So, you know, it's one of these things you need to know before you go um, type scenario just to make sure um, you're on you're on the right. And this is basically why the strategic farm, um, when Bill Burney applied, it was like, this is fantastic because David's trying all this um, and it's great to quantify it from our side of it and try and get this out. And we're very open about what works and what doesn't work. And hopefully when we do, 
finally managed to have an open day, you know, people will be able to come and see this and see the great work that David's been doing. So if we move on to our nutrition trial, um, which this was really the, the, the baby of the steering group. Um, so we've kindly selected a field um, where we've got three tram lines going on with that. Um, so we've got an untreated for start, which is um, an un, uh, untreated uh, in terms of fungicide. Um, it will be fertilized um, standard. I think I'm right, David. And then tram line two is Donald's tram line, um, which will just be, you know, a very much standard approach or, well, you know, standard agronomy approach, standard nitrogen approach. And then tram line three um, it is really the, the real time uh, IPM test before you apply. Let's see what the, what the plant's doing uh, and see where it goes. And that that's been a, a kind of an interesting scenario this year, David, in terms of getting the results quick enough um, because they're you know SEC are trying to do what they can with Tracy and Steve um, in the field to get us results there and then. But anything that gets sent away, there is just this delay, uh, which is fine for three, four, five days, um, which is great compared to the two weeks it's taken with Yen to get the results back. So it's it's this information process, David. Do you want to talk a bit through that? Yeah, the guys have done reasonably well on it. It is difficult understanding that we've, we've moved away from a process where initially it was tested at T0, T1, T2 and so forth, where actually we need more regular testing, it would appear, to get a better handle on what these crops are actually lacking or not lacking. Um, and that's been the delay. You know, it's fine to send, taking the sample, sending the results away, and the weather's great. You could put something on. You don't know what to put on, but then you get the results back. And well, through most of last month, you couldn't stick anything on the crops. So we'd see the impact on that um, in terms of uh, health of the crop. Um, the disease, the disease levels are certainly coming up in the one that's just been treated with the nutrition versus the sent, the plot two, which has had a fungicide on it and is far, far greener at the minute. Um, interestingly, the, the bricks have dropped a bit, but it's come back. It's, it hasn't come back. It dropped through the, it was very high early on with the sunshine, and then it fell away during all that rain in May, and it doesn't seem to have recovered at the minute, but we'll have to try and get a handle on that. Um, but we've certainly learned the, the testing process and sampling process and the time scale we need to sit down and work out a, a routine for that for next year. It's, it's been more about education than actually results this year, I would suggest. Absolutely, and, and product availability as well. And it, you know, in, in that um, trial, you know, one of the things that's coming out is the, that we're monitoring is the, the BRICS is a monitor of the sugars within the plant, which is where the numerical value is coming from, the percentage. And uh, Steve's um, been been looking at this. The more sugars you can get down into the soil, obviously, the more soil life we've got, which will mobilise more nutrition and, and look after the plant. Is um, in theory what what we're trying to achieve. And um, we, you know, we've got the tissue analysis, we've got the bricks. Every time Tracy's in the field, um, she does a disease score. So that's been scored through through every trial as it goes through in a very conventional sense. And I think that the goal of this from this from the steering group was not yield. It was actually to see what we get at each traditional crop timing as we go through the season. How does the disease compare? And nobody's against the, the can, you know, that's um, putting a fungicide on. If you have to do it, you have to do it. There's there's no issue with it, but it's how far can you get before you need it? And actually what's happening in the plant and in the soil when you push the button and you say, right, we need it. What's what's changed? What's happened? What's actually going on here? Uh, and, and that's where, where we're trying to figure out. And I think halfway through, we've probably got some, some realizations there that you know we're using um, a, a very technical bricks meter um, as opposed to the the twenty pound Amazon one that most of us use. You know, a zero to twenty scale, and you know the definition of the line is basically what you're after there to to take you through the other nutrients. So it's just trying to to back up um, with it. You, you know, it's a very quick test on the bricks. Um, we found already. You know, Tracy enlightened us that the, the pestle and mortar was a lot easier than the garlic press. As David broke my garlic press again. Um, so we thought, well, you know, we can't have the biggest cost of the project garlic presses. So um, we thought we'd better uh, look at an alternative to that. So we've got some of the, the tissue analysis back um, on the next slide. And some of them have been re really, really interesting. And obviously from the bricks, you've got the line, which will tell you, tells you the calcium. And I think 
what we're finding now is that's fine, but we could actually do with a, a nitrogen tester. Hope uh, Yara are listening. A free one would be fantastic. Um, so if we can get an end tester for next year, that would be really great just to not overdo the nitrogen um, on it. Because um, I suppose we should explain that's one of the things that happens at Bull Barney is that you're very much into the foliar end and only applying what the crop needs. David, would that be? Yeah, we've read and heard a lot about um, foliar urea. Um, you know, historically, it was used to boost the proteins on milling wheat. Um, but now there's a suggestion that well, we can get the urea straight into the plant. Um, Using far less energy given up by the plant, so it's in theory more efficient. You know, going forwards, we're looking at carbon, carbon footprint, nitrogen use efficiency. So anything that can happen. So most of our wheats and winter crops this year, we've put a base level of about 75 kilos of nitrogen on in early March, and then from then we've just gone with um, 10 to 15 kilos of uh, nitrogen as a foliar urea. Um, every week to 10 day, which seems intensive with the sprayer, but if you're going through trace elements and other things, you just add it in with, with a lot of the other stuff anyway. So it's, in total, it's probably not going to mean many extra passes. Um, what it has done though, and you can see from this results, and we've got others that show the same, that the um, we've got plenty of nitrogen in the plant, um, but very little of it is nitrate nitrogen. And as far as I understand it, nitrate nitrogen or certainly excess nitrates are a big driver of disease within the plant so it's quite good i hope to see that we're we're keeping these nitrate levels really well according to these results they're too low um but we're seeing that on all the half a dozen fields that we've been testing across the farm this year um that there is plenty n in the plant and it's not in the nitrate form i can't quantify whether that's had any any actual impact on the disease level or not as such and it's something that we've we've talked about and might form part of a trial in years to come uh, with the strategic farm because if we potential to get wheat yields up to standard levels and we're able to cut our nitrogen rates maybe by a third maybe by half i don't know then that's going to be a real bonus going forwards um, looking at our carbon footprint and how the rest of society looks as just an industry um, and yeah that's come partly from our carbon we did a carbon audit as well and uh, essentially 50 percent of our carbon uh, use on the farm is nitrogen fertilizer so doing if we don't look to seriously cut nitrogen fertilizer we we're just um, we're just playing at trying to cut our carbon footprint because even our fuel use our diesel use seven percent so it's way down already. Um, it's nitrogen is the big one, and that's the one we've got to try and focus on. And perhaps using foliar is a way to get around that, maybe. Absolutely. I mean, very interesting the results. And I suppose it's something that we're right, realizing as you go through this project that, that what are you testing for? And this is um, from the Nova Crop Lab uh, in Holland. And, and you'll see exactly what they're playing, you know, as the important, which is uh, what we're trying to assess you and I'm not drawing results so uh, you know this great thing about COVID is Fiona's not sat next to me kicking me so I can say things but um, you know sugars are obviously very important pH as we've discussed very important both in the plant uh, and in the soil you know and I think both have to be right so we have to get the pH right in the soil otherwise you know we're really starting from behind and then pH in the plant um, you know calcium is a big factor in that which we've discussed with Paul whether it's foliar, granular, however you do it, is something that needs to be looked at. The electrical conductivity, it, it, you know, is the pass between the, the ions and cations. How, how are we doing on that? Is it effective? Is it not? If it's very low, you're not getting the nutrition passed through. Potassium, um, again, and there it, it is a biggie, um, without a doubt. And, uh, and what we've realized is that, um, you know, from the soil side of things, it's great, but you're not getting that when you need it in the plant. So it's looking at top ups in that, which David does. And we're hoping to quantify that and just how it changes. Obviously, we've got the calcium level in there, um, and and the sulphur is obviously how 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 you put that on and when you put that on. It has um, between the two different forms, from elemental or to oxidized, you have uh, a certain amount of um, fungicidal activity. I suppose, Donald, would that be right on sulfates as opposed to elemental sulphur? 
Yeah, so that can help, especially sulfur, particularly on like your brassica crop, like oil seed rape and stuff like that. I know David hasn't got so much of that, but yeah, it can give an added help to your crop as well. I think that's a, yeah, the sulfur results just come up there. So. Absolutely. And, and there's things that we're learning that, um, you know, maybe it'll be uh, trials on, on these elements in the future just to find the exact uh, levels of it. Um, phosphorus, they don't play too heavily on that. so. Um, it, it's an interesting one, uh, you know, and as we go further down them, the manganese, iron and the silica. And interestingly, I think early season, David, when we were getting these results back, there wasn't really anything that was low, was there? It was it, the plant wasn't, well, we're saying the plant wasn't asking, I'm drawing conclusions again, but we're suggesting that the plant wasn't asking for something. Would that, would not drawing a conclusion, is that what you were thinking? Yeah, because... The graphs vary up and down, as you can see. Some things are short, silica is short, boron, which we probably ought to uh, do something about. Um, it's very hard to know what's really, really important. This crop hasn't had any phosphate put on on the soil, um, and yet it appears to have plenty. Interestingly, Paul commented al aluminium earlier on. The first result we took from here in March, I think, was uh, had very high aluminium in the crop, which we got a bit worried about. But subsequent, it, it just reduced and came down, and now it's non-existent. So we've done nothing, I don't think, to change that potentially. Um, have you any idea why that might have happened? Why was it so high early on in the season, Paul? I think that could be just uh, the kind of uh, climatic and uh, temperature and just the conditions within the soil there. You're not getting the same buffering capacity that you are uh, uh, when it uh, starts to dry out. So there's a lot, uh, there's a lot more water in the soil. There's a lot more chance of uh, uh, aluminium becoming soluble. So and as the plant grows, it just utilizes anything it can do. So, uh, but that evens out as as the plant starts to grow and really. From the uh, from the soil chemistry that I've seen again, not drawing conclusions, uh, and the pH that you've got, then aluminium shouldn't be a problem at all. It, it kind of highlights the fact that these results have varied throughout the season, and you know the best will in the world. Are we right to dash around with a can or something to correct the silica, the silica to correct the boron, or? we could test that in a fortnight and the crop's fine and we've done nothing. Uh, we really don't know the answers to these and we can spend an awful lot of money very quickly and think we're being very clever, but if we're just patient, we'll get the, we'll might get the solution for nothing. And, and very, very interesting as well, um, you know, high, high rainfall for me, which, you know, biblical proportions, you're just about building an ark in places, but, um, you know how what impact has that had on the plant you know you've probably seen a lot of elements Paul rinsed out the soil is that a word is that a phrase or how does the amount of rainfall impact that well we could try leaching but uh yeah I mean it yeah. will do uh <laughs> <laughs> Again, from you know, you you from your nitrogen you've put on to more soluble elements like sulfur and uh, and calcium. It's uh, it's all there. That uh, the wetter the soil is, the more uh, water movement that that will be taken away. And again. It's soil structure as well. Uh, David said earlier that there's potentially some capping on parts of the field. If there's any slope there, you will see movement across the surface of the the soil even with uh, a couple of millimetres of capping on the surface there. That uh, reduces the water infiltration, the porosity of the surface, and encourages water to run across the surface or pool on the surface and take those um, particles with them. So again, I'm, I'm going to... I don't want to turn 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 this into uh, an advert, but uh, using VES is useful there because you're looking at the whole soil pro, uh, profile and you're looking, hopefully, to identify within that profile where the constraints are or the limiting layer is. It might not always be down at depth where you're expecting it. It can be at the surface and it can only be a few millimetres thick, but that is all that's needed to... Uh, but once you understand that that's the problem, then hopefully you can do something about it. Absolutely. And um, I think we've got Christian uh, just putting him on the spot here with a poll, just wondering how useful um, this type of information is uh, for people. Just wondering, you know, how many people are using tissue sap analysis? I mean, Yen 
the Yen project has been fantastic for realising uh, and you know just what's going on with your crop and the collation of the results that they uh, produce for it. So it's something you know there probably is a, a defined protocol in this once you get through a few years of tissue testing maybe you don't need to do as much unless you've got an issue um but uh, it would just like, be interesting to know uh, people people's views on it um if you can get us the answers again christian can i close that so that's interesting yeah quite a lot of people starting to to, to look into it um you know, and I think it's a it's a very uh, you know fantastic way of getting into IPM. You know, test before you apply. What are we needing to do? Are we lacking anything before we just re reach for the can, or you know, get down that route of just putting more on for for no real reason? Um, you know, we won't go into the more on effect because I think we're probably out of time there as well. Um, so probably m moving through them, we're we're, we're uh, other um, tools that HDB has that that, that can be of use to you. I mean. The business impact calculator there that's um you know an absolutely fantastic tool that you should have a play around with we've managed to get everything into the harvest toolkit as well so people can find it and actually use it and um, the rl which is now there in an app uh, and online um which is also great uh, other things that are coming up um through the summer here um we've got quite a, a strong program which david and i are in the first two weeks of which is great i suppose so we're on next friday again so i hope you do join us um for our workshop that's coming on uh, on the next slide we can detail that i think we've got um our research updates which are today but our how-to workshops uh which we've got uh, which paul's joined us again and steve hode uh, and i think joel williams is on in the morning and afternoon and then we're joined again in the afternoon by joel we've got penny uh, hundleby as well uh, who's going to take us through some plant genetics um, Joel's going to take us through his science as well and we've got Ben Taylor Davies joining us um, as well for that one uh, so we're going to have a few presentations and break out into into really facilitated discussion rooms and try and dig into the detail with that um, and then we've got them field flowering strips which Lorna uh, who's uh, Cole from SIUC who's in this one she's in that one as well which is great because she's really pushing this hard and you should follow Lorna on Twitter um, she's she's got absolutely brilliant tweets that she puts out from when she's seeing things, and she was telling us spiders um, that's that's around her house she has in tubs uh, that she's looking at as well, just to try and identify. Um, and then the 25th of June, um, identifying your marginal land, um, which is a very interesting one, um, just as to how you classify it uh, and the impacts that that, that, that does have. Um, so again, on to our, our last couple of slides, um, we do have the, the Arable Connections on the website, which is where you'll find all the events to book on to, and you'll see them on Twitter and on Facebook uh, as much as we can. I would probably just like to, to say thanks very much to Paul and Donald and David uh, for joining us, and Christian, we've put a lot of pressure on you for these webinars today. Thanks very much for, 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 for managing uh, to put them through. So. Um, we've got um, the Serials Twitter account, we've got HDB Scotland, which you'll have seen, uh, Sheila's been out uh, taking picture of us when we're doing some of these assessments and having a look through just to try and monitor it. Um, so thank you very much to everybody that's there. Again, if you're in the questions, quickly basis and Rosal points, pop them in. If you haven't done so, uh, we'll get them out to you. Uh, and thanks very much for joining us and we'll see you next week, um, a bit earlier then. I think it's half past eight in the morning for the first session. So. <laughs> We'll need to be up out of bed sharpish that time, that's for sure. Okay, thanks very much, everyone. Bye now.